So hello everybody, it's past two o'clock. Um, somebody wrote in the chat, um, on Anne, 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 um, that there might be some people late. So I'm going to delay with the lecture for, for five minutes to give everybody the time um, to really join. But uh, I'm saying this just for, for you all to know. And in case um, somebody hasn't seen the chat function which exists in Zoom. Um, this is important to use. You can see some information here. When you do have um, questions which you can also ask during, you can hear me, yeah? Okay, um, you can then also um, ask questions here. I will try to follow it um, during the seminar. So sometimes it's better if you ask questions when there is a specific slide with a specific graph, maybe something has not been clear. Um, sometimes it's difficult to follow up on this or to, for me to realize it. So as we are few people and normally it's only me talking, you can then also just switch your microphone on and say, uh, excuse me, sorry, I have here a question. For more general questions, of course, there will also be the opportunity in the break um, to, to ask these questions. I will make a break after about 45 minutes. It's not exactly like this. Um, it depends on where in the lecture I will be to give everybody the opportunity to, to use the bathroom to get a break, to, to get a coffee and then continue. And then after the lectures, of course, there will also be time. Um, the lecture is on Zoom. We are only 24 people so far on Zoom. And it's also um, live recording here on YouTube. There's eight people that's including myself. So altogether it's um, 30, 30 students only. Um, at the moment we will see whether more people are coming in. But of course the one advantage of YouTube is that you can also, or other students can also watch it at a later stage on, on YouTube. So this is some, some general information, some of which I will also repeat um, once the lecture um, begins now in one or two minutes. So by repeating this, it also means the people that will only switch in um, after some minutes, they will only miss this administrative information, but they can also look it up on YouTube or it's anyway presented within also the, the PDF that I, I, I sent around, I believe it was last week. So um, one thing to remember is um, that YouTube has a time lag. So what, what people on Zoom here now will be only after 30 seconds up approximately up to one minute on, on YouTube, which is why it's, and I cannot uh, monitor the chat on Zoom and YouTube at the same time, which is why for people that are only watching on YouTube, I will only address the questions in the two breaks. Otherwise it, it will not be possible um, for me to do this simultaneously. Good. So with this, I'm, I'm studying um, the lecture. There's still time for other people to join, but I see for the last nearly 10 minutes, no, in, at least in Zoom, nobody else um, was joining. So I'm going to give you five times two hours of lectures on um, social systems. Four of these lectures this autumn and the other one will be um, at some time beginning of next year. So I would like to introduce myself. My name is Carsten Schrade and I'm a director of research at the EPHC DEP, the same institution where Cedric Suer is. And I'm working um, on social systems um, for my entire academic life. I started my 
what these days would be called um, um, master thesis on, on these social bird cichlids, did my PhD on monkeys. And now for 20 years, I've been working on African striped mice and especially um, the, the striped mice and the studies on it will also reoccur repeatedly um, during my lectures. I'm um, here the scenery is in Strasbourg, obviously, but I'm also, I have a honorary professorship in Zurich, where I also have been teaching in September for two days that all of this was also remote. And due to my field studies, I'm also associated to the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. So this just is some background information on me. Now um, comes the five double lectures, one, two, three, four, five. The one is today and unfortunately for some um, reasons it has to be remotely um, via Zoom. To, I couldn't avoid it differently and um, today, tomorrow I can't lecture as it was planned. I could switch with somebody else. And um, this is just to, to give you an overview. And as I told you, and this um, comes here, I then let you choose whether the other lectures should be like normally in the lecture hall or whether you prefer it on, on Zoom and then YouTube, you can, can watch it up again. This, um, I also have to tell you, will not be a majority um, decision. I don't know exactly your situation. Let's say when um, out of 60 students, 40 say they want it remotely, but the other 20 students say it's impossible for them because they have to run to another lecture afterwards before they cannot arrange it. And then it will be just in the lecture hall like, like it normally is. But um, we are all adult people and so it, Today it has to be on Zoom, and, but then for the remaining lectures, I, I give the choice to you. It also means if you vote on Doodle No, and you have a very good reason why it's impossible, then you can also please send me an email that I know it's not only that 10 people don't want to, but out of 60, but the 10 people, they really don't have another choice. And then these constraints of these 10 people have to be um, the priority. Um, so now we're talking about um, social systems. This is something which um, for many people is quite fascinating and we have a quite diversity of social systems in the animal kingdom. We have um, pair living um, calitrichid monkeys in the Amazon forest. We have species that are said to be solitary living um, like this um, rhinoceros that I took in Etosha. I think it's a black rhino if I see that correctly. Uh, pair living again in these um, burying beetles which occur here in Europe and, and all this um, biodiversity of social systems that we see in the animal kingdom. And one of the main focuses in the research on um, in behavioral ecology over the last decades was how can we explain um, this um, diversity. And when we ask how we want to, to explain this, and in science, if you want to explain something, the, one of the first steps we normally always take is that we want to define what we're really talking about so that we can grab it and that we know when we talk to other people, they talk about the same thing like we do. And especially in the field of social evolution, there's unfortunately often confusion that people use um, the same terms for different things. So when you talk about social systems, what do we really mean with this? Other people talk about animal societies. Is this the same? What is sociality? Can there be unsociality? Social organization, is this the same? Like social structure and social system or something else, mating system is a more obvious when we talk about mating system and what, what, what we actually are addressing. And infant care system, it's also obvious, more obvious. But these um, terms that I showed you above here in this, I don't know even how you would call this, this, this color, it's kind of, of a grayish green. For many people, it's kind of the same. And because these are terms we use in general talking, we think we know what it is, but if we, if you want to work on it scientifically, we really have to just define it. And we have to be sure that other people use the same definitions. For example, when I talk about social organization, it is sometimes, and I think today there will be an example, um, people use for the sa same thing, the term social structure, which for me is something different. And thus it's very, really very, very important to have um, these um, um, clear definitions. And, the best way it has been defined from my point of view and the point of view of many other people in this field has been done um, at this um, categorization by Kappler and Van Schaik. And um, 
the graph you see has adopted from a paper from Kappler from 2018, which actually is wrong. It was published online 2018, but the print version came out January 2019. Anyway, and this is the way we are using it here. Many people are using it. So when we talk about social systems, there are four categories that have to be distinguished. And in my first four double lectures, I will talk about one of these categories during each of the, of the double lectures. So the first one is um, um, social organization. That's the group composition. How many individuals are in each social units? What is are these males, females, and so on? What is the group size and also the kinship pattern? It's a difference whether there are three males and one female and the three males are un unrelated or whether two of the males are adult sons from, from the breeding pair. Then the social structure shown here is about social interactions between groups, how are individuals interacting with each other. For example, social network analysis that are done um, by Cedric Suer and um, his um, students at the DEP, I think Sebastian is going to talk about this to you or has been talking, um, is an important topic here. And social structure also um, has in it um, the large field of animal communication about which we will also have um, additional lectures um, by others. Then the mating system, which is what we will talk about today, is more obvious. It's about roommates with home. So what we observe, but also the um, consequences out of this, who is actually reproducing. And an important aspect here that we will also um, address today are alternative reproductive tactics when individuals have different ways of reaching reproductive success. And finally, the care system is about who is taking care of the infants. It can be nobody, like in most invertebrates, they just lie eggs and then the larvae have to look after themselves. It can be only maternal care, like in many mammals. It can be only paternal care, like in seahorses, or be parental care, like in most passerine birds. And this, um, okay, tomorrow is not wrong. That was supposed to be tomorrow, but this is then what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, okay, this is um, the Sebastian. I, I'm not sure if the if the um, if the date on here, the 27th of November, is is still correct. Now, this um, categorization I showed you comes from Peter Kappeler. He is a um, senior scientist at the German Primate Center in Göttingen. And what I want to point out here for you is that he is actually giving a talk at the International Remote Seminar on Frontiers in Social Evolution, which is co-organized by myself. He is presenting on the 3rd of November. And if any one of you is highly interested in social evolution, you're more than welcome to um, join um, this seminar. You can either join it on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel for this seminar. You can make um, register to this YouTube channel. You will be informed about upcoming talks tonight at five o'clock um, European time. There will be a talk by by, where is she? It will, oh no, that's not that one. There will be a talk um, on um, Capuchin monkey, no, on holo monkeys. Why do I not see this video of her? Let me see um, here by, this talk will be um, tonight by uh, Sari, Sari van Bell. She's at, at Austin, Texas. It'll be quite interesting. So you're always welcome to join this and just to show you that and also this, some of the researchers you will hear about um, during uh, my lectures, um, you could meet uh, actually in person. Um, these lectures, um, these seminars are also held via Zoom. So if you want to interact with um, the researchers, want to ask questions, you can send me an email and I will put you on the email list and you will get weekly reminders with um, the seminar that this is going to happen and you're more than welcome to join. It's actually one of these aims um, that students from all over the world can use the seminar series to meet um, international experts in the field of social evolution. We have nearly 300 registered um, participants in the fine seminar, though it's rather um, 100 that participate um, every time. There's also, of course, um, sometimes um, problems that because of time differences between 
um, our colleagues in the United States, we have colleagues from South America, we have colleagues from Africa, from Australia joining the seminar series. So not everyone can be there all the time, but also here one can um, listen to these um, presentations later on YouTube. So if you're interested, register on it on our YouTube channel or send me an email, then you can participate via Zoom. So going on, this is the overview. You will see um, the Jordan Martin is from Zurich is talking next week about comparative approaches to evolution of human um, sociality. The earlier Shelton, a young researcher, will talk about um, social um, networks in, in, in zebra um, fish. And you see there's, there's quite a lot of, of interesting talks and there's really with Peter Kappler, Kay Holcamp, Martha Manzer, Dan Bloomstein, there's also really people that in our field um, are, are, are very, very important um, um, scientists. So, but coming back to, to my own lecture on um, social systems, and today we are going to talk about mating systems. And mating systems, interesting thing is that often not by looking at the uh, actually behavior or, or reproductive consequences, but just looking at the morphology of species, we can make some assumptions about um, the mating system. You see here skulls of two primate species. It's always on the left hand, the female, on the right hand, the male, the female, the male. And simply by looking at the skulls and recognizing this, um, the significant sexual dimorphism in the one species, but not in the other species, we can make assumptions. The assumption is that there's much more competition between males who get access to females than in this species. And in fact, um, on the left-hand side, we see pair living and monogamously mating um, gibbons, while on the right-hand side, um, this is um, papio, this is um, our baboons that live in multi-male, multi-female groups. So here it's one pair within the, uh, there's no, in within groups, there's no competition between males as there's only one breeding males, but within baboons, there are multiple males and multiple females in the troops. And there's quite some, some competition occurring. And I hope you can, can see this, that your, your computer screen is, is big enough. I see now on my screen that I should have taken a, uh, a better, uh, more clear figure. What we have here is a sex ratio in the breeding group. That means the number of breeding females per breeding males. So here are pair living. So here are either pair living species or species with an equal sex ratio, like um, Hylobates. These are the gibbons. The, they live in pairs, so one male, one female, but also pan. That's um, the chimpanzee, where there are as many males as females per group, and um, here are more females than breeding pair. And this is a sexual dimorphism. We see here with equal sex ratio, there's quite a variance in um, the sexual dimorphism because equal um, sex ratio can either mean, like I said, in Hylobates in the, um, in, in, in these species, in the gibbons, um, there's low sexual dimorphism because they live in pairs. So it can be like in, in chimpanzees, it's just um, groups of equal, um, sex ratio, but then in macaques and, and papio and baboons and, and other species, there are many more females um, than males. And then with this, the degree of sexual dimorphism is also increasing as a consequence of sexual selection and competition between males for the access to females. And this kind of um, dimorphism observed in the morphology has even been used to make um, statements about the expected um, social organization and mating system of our um, own ancestors. For example, here we have um, a skull of Australopithecus, Australopithecus sediba, um, an Australopithecus species from um, South Africa. And in um, some of these Australopithecus species, there has been found a strong sexual dimorphism, indicating that um, social units may be consisted of um, one male with several females. And then the further we go along to um, the genus of Homo, the sexual dimorphism has been decreased, but we all know it's not zero these days, it, it still exists, indicating that within groups, competition between males might have um, decreased as well. And here you see the same um, graph. Uh, that's the, the reason why I put it separately here. Again, 
um, bigger that you see that with the increase of sexual dimorphism, if you would put a line through here, with the um, inc increase of having a female biased um, sex ratio within primate groups. So mating system can uh, be, we have different categories. We um, can categorize them. And at the end of this talk, I will say why this might not be always that useful, but for now, and because everybody also knows these terms, it's important to bring them up. That can be promiscuity, polytrinandry, monogamy, polyandry, polygyny, and it could be territorial defense or harm defense, polygyny, or lacking systems. Now, important um, to say here, what are these different forms? Promiscuity, and I will bring later examples for, for, for all or most of these um, systems. Promiscuity means males made with, se with several females and females made with several males. And, and that's the difference to polytrinantry, there is no mate choice. Polytrinantry also means uh, males can mate with several females, females mate with several males, but the difference between the two is, in this case, we have mate choice, in this case, we don't have it. For example, um, some invertebrates might, might show promiscuity, for example, corals. They just release their sperm into the water and their eggs, and then they meet, and there's no, no mate choice really happening there. While in species living in multi-male, multi-female groups like baboons, they might mate with several members of the opposite sex, and both sexes do this, but a female in a baboon group, she does not mate randomly. She has specific relationships with some males. She might mate with them, but not with others. So there is something like mate choice, choice happening. Monogamy is obvious. Then the, there's only one male and reproducing with one female. Polyandry, one female reproduces with several males, and polygyny, and one male reproduces with um, several females. But first, we, before we continue talking about um, these different forms of mating systems, and obviously um, the number of males and females that mate with each other is very important here, I would like to address the, from an evolutionary point of view, very interesting question, um, what, what is, is sex, what are the sexes, and why did sex evolve? So what is sex? And I'm talking here about the scientific and perspective. Sex is the production of offspring by the fusion of two gametes. They can also be like you might know, non-sexual reproduction like shooting plants. It's when you take from some plant species um, a stick with some leaves and put it in the soil. It might grow some, some, some roots and there will be, a, will be a new plant or cell division in protozoa where simply a protozoa um, divides the cells and out of one individual um, you get two. Uh, sexual behavior and that's what in, in normal language people think is sex but not in biology. Sexual behavior are behavioral patterns that could lead to sexual reproduction but sexual behavior can also be highly ritualized. For example, use the signals for communication not for reproduction in primates not all cases of sexual behavior in primates are done there um, for the aim to um, reproduce um, immediately. It can also be a find of communication and forming social bonds. So what are the sexes? There can be only two sexes and I will tell you later why. And these two sexes are defined by the size of the gametes. More, males produce small gametes. These gametes are called sperm and females produce large gametes, they're called eggs. And species with sexes are called anisogamous. Anisogamous means the gametes have different sizes. There can also be isogamous species where the gametes have the same size. There might be different um, mating types, but they don't have small and large gametes, but all gametes have the same size. So no sexes exist. For example, in several species of fungi, algae, but also protozoa, um, this occurs and such isogamous species can then often have different mating types. It means even though the gametes are the same size, not every gamete can fuse with every other gamete to form a zygote, but only with a gamete of an other mating type than, than it has. So importantly, 
Sex without sexes is possible. So sex defined as um, the um, production of offspring by the fusion of two gametes can be can happen without that there are two different sexes. And why did sex evolve? It, it evolved because of the runaway selection between host and pathogens and to avoid accumulation of negative mutations. So we will talk about this in detail now. Um, okay, I just got some message, but I think this was not on, on, on Zoom. Um, evolution of, um, of the sexes. The first question is why, why would anybody bother around asking why, why, why do two sexes exist? I mean, isn't, it, isn't this obvious? And from an evolutionary point of view, it is not obvious why two sexes should exist because um, sex has costs. There are costs and benefits and there's a twofold cost of sex. The first one is the genes get diluted, the offspring of a sexual reproducing species are only related by 50% with one parent, not by 100%, like with unsexual reproduction. And only half of the number of offspring are produced because um, for every offspring produced, you need one large gamete, so it's called an egg. And the small gametes, the sperm alone, cannot produce um, any offspring. So this is um, shown here in this example, where on the left-hand side, we have a potentially um, non-sexually reproducing species on the right hand side a sexually reproducing one and um, <laughs> you see here these two individuals you can't call them males or females because there's only one um, type of gamete producing individuals in this species each of them produces two gametes and every gamete um, will result in one offspring which is 100% identical with the parent. But here in the sexual species, the female and the male have to work together to produce um, gametes and offspring, also males and females again. And so out of the two gametes produced by this female, only two offspring can be produced while the gametes of this male alone could not produce any offspring alone. And that's only half as many offsprings are produced, which at the same time, are only related to 50 and not 100% to the parent, explaining the twofold costs of sexual um, reproduction. And if you go on to the next generation, of course, this becomes um, more and more of, of a problem. There are additional costs, for example, um, beneficial gene combinations are broken up. Maybe an individual is very well adapted to its, the, the environment it's living in and its partner is not as well adapted and producing offspring with this partner will lead to offspring that are less well um, adapted to, to this environment. Then finding, attracting, and choosing a mate can be very costly. And we all know that this is um, one of the major challenges we are facing at least at some stage in our life. And last but not least, it leads to the transfer of um, sexual diseases, which is um, very unhealthy. And if you want to read about this, I can um, recommend to you this book, which in English is called The Good Book of Human Nature by Carl van Schaik, I'm an pro anthropology professor at the University of Zurich, where he explains why they believe that the emergence of sexual disease in human society with increasing population size at the end of the Neolithicum, um, where the um, humans um, began to, to become, um, to settle down and not to be uh, foragers and hunters anymore. Why they, they think that this had a major impact on the occurrence of religion and religious rules and that many of the rules that are um, outlined in the Old Testament of the Bible are actually rules to avoid the transmission of sexual disease, which became quite abundant as human society, humans started to settle down and to form large scale societies. It's also especially interesting at this time of, of um, our life with this Corona pandemic, because it also relates to the question at when do pathogens become a real problem in our pandemics? possible because this is only possible in species that have high population densities. Beforehand, when we were only hunter gatherers and population densities were very low or disease like Corona or both of the sexual diseases, they just could not have spread in the population. And many of these same diseases um, that, that we know about, they only emerged and became 
um, a problem for humanity when we started to settle down. Our population densities became high enough. At the same time, we were starting to have um, domestic livestock and um, pathogens from domestic livestock like pigs and cattle could jump over to our species and infect us. So what are the benefits? Um, some um, people say the benefit of sex is the production of offspring um, with new genetic composition. But this is not the benefit of sexual reproduction. This is the definition of what it is. You cannot say define something and say the definition is um, the benefit that le led to, to its evolution. There are other better theories to explain how um, the production of offspring that is um, genetically different from the parents can be of benefit for evolutionary fitness. <coughs> the first one is the Miller's ratchet. And here the idea is to get rid of the deleterious mutations that otherwise would accumulate um, one needs sexual reproduction. So what is meant with this? It's meant that deleterious mutations, that means mutations that are not good occur in every generation. And if you cannot get rid of them, then from one generation to the next, there will be more and more and more and more of these um, negative mutations. Um, this year, what, what, what you see here, this picture is a ratchet. When you come from the, the ELSAs, you might know what it is because it's also commonly used in the, the carnival, if you call it carnival here in this area, it's something where it can make a lot of noise and it can only go in one direction. It cannot go back. And that's the same with deleterious mutations. Once there is one, if there's no sexual reproduction, it cannot, you cannot go back to a previous state without this mutation, it will stay there. The next one will be added on this and so on. But by sexual reproduction, you can create offspring that are genetically different. And some of these offspring will have less mutations, the deleterious mutations than the parents. And like this, you can, you will have some offspring that have a lot of mutations and that will have low survival probability, but other offspring might have less mutations and be, be better off. Tangled bank that states that um, environments, sorry, that I'm working with some international students, they send me messages on Slack. Um, that states that um, the environments differ, which means they are complex organized and different environmental conditions need different genetics adaptations. And you see here this picture of a very diverse tropical rainforest environment. Um, the area where um, the parents live might be different from the area where the offspring lives, even when the area where the offspring disperses to is very close by on a few kilometers away, when the habitat is highly um, variable, then um, the best genetic background for the environment here might not be good for the environment up there. And then um, genetic reproduction might produce offspring that can better deal with this variability. But the, um, these days most um, supported hypothesis is the red queen hypothesis. It comes from this um, book, Alice in the Wonderland, where you have this red queen and Alice came to this wonderland. She is, I, I don't remember the reason, she's running very fast with this red queen through the environment, but the environment does not change. It always looks the same and Alice asks the red queen, but this is very strange in, in my world where I come from, if you run very fast, you get somewhere else here and here it doesn't change. And then the, the red queen says, yes, here it is. If you want to stay the same place, you have to run very fast. And the place which is meant here with regards to sexual reproduction, is um, the place of the and uh, of the pathogenic environment. It's about the combat between um, hosts and and the part and the pathogens. Meaning, if um, a species doesn't change, the pathogens, the bacteria, the fungi, whatsoever that live from this host can adapt very nicely to this host and exploit it. Um, to a very large extent and to be able for the house to fight off the pathogens, it has to change genetically and have new genetic variation and um, new genetic backgrounds um, to be able to deal with its um, pathogenic environment. So that might explain why, especially the red green hypothesis, why there is sex, why it's beneficial 
instead of the twofold cost of sex to reproduce um, sexually. But the next question is then, why are there males and females? Why are there two types of sexes and exactly two and not three or four or a different number? So we know that there are species um, in, like I told you, some fungi, some algae, protozoa, where there are no sexes. They have sexual reproduction, but um, there's isogamy where the gametes of all individuals are about the same size. And um, this is what people assume was the original stage um, in evolutionary history. And when um, individuals produce only one gamete, which gametes um, that then um, form zygotes with another gamete are the most successful ones. Typically it's the biggest ones because they have the most resources that they got from their parents. So if you think about um, a protozoa, they are writing into two parts. When the two parts are the same size, they might survive, but imagine one, one of the, them might, might, might be very, very small. It, the survival probability would be much reduced. So there's an advantage of forming um, zygotes that are big. And that this means there's an advantage of having big gametes that the offspring has more resources and can survive better. So the advantage of building zygotes with, with large gametes means on the other hand, there's an advantage to be able to find big gametes. So if there's an individual reproducing, it, may, it might produce um, its own gametes. And then there's selection pressure to fuse the own gametes with other gametes that are as big as possible to increase reproductive success. And this um, led to some runaway um, selection. There, are, okay, there can be an advantage for small gametes that are more agile that can move around and search for the other big gametes. And um, big gametes then get parasitized by, by these small ones. And you see already where this is leading to, there will be selection pressure on the big gametes to reject the small ones because the small ones are like parasites. But on the other hand, if they don't build zygotes at all, their reproductive success will also be zero. And if they cannot meet with other big gametes, they, their selection pressure that they fuse with the small gametes to produce um, a zygote, otherwise there's no reproductive success at all. So at some stage then, because, um, when you produce small agile gametes with the same resources, you can produce many more small ones than another individual can produce big ones. And there was surplus of um, small gametes. And then at some stage, the big gametes um, gave up their mobility. They were investing instead of being mobile and being bigger. And these gametes um, then became kind of big and, and sessile and they are called eggs. And the small gametes that are specialized more and more in being um, mobile and, and being able to quickly find the big gametes, the eggs to fertilize them. And these gametes these days are called sperms. So in other way, because of this runaway selection, um, two sexes developed and the male gametes, the sperms of kind of, from this evolutionary perspective, are parasitizing the large gametes, the, the eggs, and this then led to the evolution of the two sexes. And in this scenario, it's only possible to have two sexes. The big ones have higher success and the small ones. A third sex with gametes of the intermediate sex would do worse than the small gametes in finding the big ones because they're not so mobile. And they would also do worse than the big gametes, the eggs, because if they are fertilized by another um, gamete, then um, the, the resulting zygote would be still below average in size. So an intermediate gamete size of a third possible sex would um, have lower reproductive success than the two other sexes. And this is why only two sexes are possible from an evolutionary perspective. So the consequences of all of this is that males invest in fertilization, females invest in offspring. And this leads to conflict between the sexes, which um, explains a lot of what we observe in um, the animal kingdom and when we are studying the evolution of social systems. So with this, I'm coming to the mating system of a species. And the main question here is basically how many males mate with how many females? So it's about who mates with whom, who reproduces, because um, Matings from the behavioral point of view might not always lead to fertilizations. And on the very end, I will also talk to some extent about alternative reproductive tactics. So promiscuity, like I said before, 
is when both male and female mate randomly with different individuals of the opposite sex. And this is what we, are, for example, observe in, in corals or also in this um, snow hair from, from Canada, where it seems that they that has been studied that they just mate randomly. There are no individual bonds. Of course, in corals, you cannot expect individual bonds, but also in these snow hairs, they don't exist. There is no mate choice, but mating occurs randomly. And this is quite rare in animals. And why is it rare? Because mate choice is typically very important to determine quality of offspring and as such reproductive success in most species, there have been quite some selection pressure on mate choice and that individuals and choose the correct partners. So it can occur when mate choice is not possible, for example, in a highly unpredictable environment, that's sort of like the snow hair, where it's unknown which mate carries the best genes, or when population density is very low, because when population density is extremely low and it's unlikely to find another part, partner of the other sex at all, then once you find one, then, then you should mate and reproduce and not wait um, if so something else comes up. Polygynandry is polygamy of both sexes. It means several males and, and several males mate um, with each other. So several females mate with several males and, and uh, males mate with several females like we have here in this um, baboon, Papua Anubis, and in this um, uh, Prunella modularis. Oh, I, I forgot, maybe it comes, what's the English name for this bird? Um, it's... It's a bird that's quite common in, in gardens and parks, in, especially in the UK where they've been studied, but also to some extent in, in Middle Europe. In, I only know the Latin name now, which is Prunella modularis. So in here, even though every female might mate with several males and a male with several females, there is no random mating, but mate choice is important. Bonding can exist between males and females, which often know each other individually. And this is, the case and both in, in obviously in baboons, you know each other very well, but not everyone mates with everyone. And also these um, these songbirds, um, if somebody knows the name in English or even in French, you can write it in the comment. It is, um, I can write it here, Brunella Modularis. Um, they're, they're, they, they form specific groups and they defend the territory together against other individuals and so they would not randomly mate with the neighbors. I have to go back to the screen. So polygyny is polygamy of the males. So polygamy always means that um, one sex is reproducing with several individuals of the opposite sex. And here um, a male mates with several females, while females mate with only one male, at least at a specific time. Over time, it, it might differ, like in these um, elephant seals, where one male defends a harem with, with many, many females, and he mates with all the females, but this female in the next year might be another harem and mate with, 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 with another male. Uh, here we have, um, we actually had a talk about this um, Lamprologus calypterus. Um, it's a cichlid fish from, from Lake Tanchanika. Um, and here we have the largest sexual dimorphism in vertebrates. And in this um, species, the male defends um, these snail shells and an entire territory full of snail shells. And the females are much smaller than him. He is about 15 centimeters. The females are only two centimeters and they fit in these snail shells. And they use these snail shells um, to lay their eggs in there because then the offspring, the fry, will be quite protected in it. So there can be, like I said, simultaneous polygyny. A male associates with several females at once. This is then um, traditionally called a harem, like we see here in these elephant seals. Um, there can be successive polygyny. A male associates with several females in succession. That's that's a lack. And this is what you see here in um, these um, different antelopes. The topi from Tan Tanzania, not Tanana. Coming like Donald Trump. Um, this is Tanzania, not Tanzania, <laughs> or the black bug in India. Also, these um, Kabakali in, in Europe, where um, several females are together at a place that is playing. Everybody sh male sh tries to, to be the most impressive one. And so there's many males in a very small area. And then the females come and they choose one male, typically it's the male in the center, the most attractive male, and the females might all mate um, with these centered males and not, not with the other males. 
Also showing here how important female choice is in this mating system. It's not the males, it's the females here who decide to mate with whom. For example, in contrast to the elephant seals, here the elephants steal males, they protect a specific area on the beach. And then if the females are there, they have to mate with this male because he is there. Um, so it's depending on the, on the resource of the territory in contrast to the legs where the males display and the female um, choose the one which they um, regard to be the most attractive male. Polyantry is polygamy of the females. Here a female um, mates with several males at once, either simultaneous polyantry or in succession, successive polyantry. Of course, they cannot really mate with several females at at once at the same time, but within a short time period. For example, the honeybee, when the, the young queens leave the nest uh, swarming, they mate in, 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 at the same time, it means the same day with several, meme, with several males. Also in these um, two bird species, the Galapagos hawk and the yakana. Here, one female lives in a group with two or more males. And all these males are mating with the female. And importantly, and that's then often the, that's a decent birds, that's the reason why polyantry um, evolved or is of benefit for the female is that all males participate in taking care of the, of the offspring. And in birds where the reproductive success of female is limited, like in, in all species by the number of eggs she can produce. It means if she doesn't have to show maternal care, she can instead invest um, her resources in um, producing additional eggs and as such um, increase her reproductive success. And if the, because the males are taking care of the chicks and the eggs, they're brooding, they're feeding, guarding um, the offspring and the female can then produce more eggs um, within the breeding season. Monogamy, here a male and a female are a pair, part of a whole breeding season until the death of one partner. And I will bring this up again when I talk about social organization. Monogamy is a very difficult term because it's used for different things. And um, people also talk about social monogamy, that is when they observe pair living. But in social monogamy, extra pair copulations might be common. So the social organization, which I will talk about um, next week, I believe, um, of living in pairs does not mean the mating system is uh, monogamous, that one male only mates with one female and so on, that there can be extra pair copulations leading um, to, to a less monogamous situation. So that is then the difference to what we call um, genetic monogamy, where extra pair copulations um, should be uncommon. So that's what I wrote here. The term monogamy should only be used for the mating system, not for the social organization. For social organization, when we just observe them as one male, one female, we should say they're pair living, not that they're monogamous. And especially using the term of social monogamy leads into a lot of confusion. At the very beginning of my lecture, I said um, how important it is to define the terms we are using and not, not to, to mix, mix them up. I will um, now um, finish talking about monogamy, then we make a 10 minutes break. Here, what has been differentiated is facultative monogamy and obligate monogamy. Facultative monogamy you find in species like elephant shrews, which I have also studied for some time in South Africa, dick dick, some dwarf antelopes or despairing beetles. Here, the partners have the same territory. There's a male strategy of mate guarding. So one of the main reasons they live in pairs is that one male looks after one female all the time and makes sure that he mates with her and no other male. This is typically found under situations of low population density when it's maybe worthwhile to defend one female, but it's nearly impossible to defend several females that might live them separately dispersed. There's at least in elephant shrews and these beetles, not so in dick dick, there's no pair bond. The male and the female, they don't form a specific social bond. There's no paternal care. The male doesn't show care of the offspring. Their relationships are not, not admissible. For example, in elephant shrews, you will never see the male and the female sitting together, grooming each other, being nice to each other. They just are close to each other because the male is watching over the females, but it's not like they have um, specific um, relationships. That's what's written here. The partner might not spend much time together. For example, here, um, 
um, here we have um, an example of dictics where 11 families with um, this is now about um, about um, um, about the genetics. Interestingly, in these um, um, dictics, the male is guarding the female, so they're highly um, aggressive towards individuals that come from the outside, their neighbors, to keep them away from their territory. And this study, quite old by Pratt and all from 1997, founded in 11 families, and they were from quite different um, populations, Namibia and um, Kenya. The DNA test they did, they showed that in all cases, the male of the pair was the father of the offspring, showing that the male is quite successful in mate guarding, keeping his female away from, from other males. Um, in elephant shrews here, like the round-eared elephant shrew we studied in, in South Africa, we have the same indication. The home ranges between males and females overlap to a large extent, more the female with the male, because males have larger home ranges still. They overlap also with some other females um, to some extent, but they're also um, just keeping a larger home range to keep competitors away. And um, the distance when you, what the student did, she radio tracked the male and the female, one after the other, and then she measured the distance between them in meters. And this depended on the reproductive state of the female when she was in estrus. That means she was ready to mate. The distance was much lower than during periods that she was not um, um, sexually um, um, receptive. And um, it also already shows you, I mean, these are small animals, they're about that size, that the distance between them in these other periods of 50 meters, this is quite a, a long distance for, for such, such a, a small mammal. So they don't really, it's not like the males and females like each other and spend much time with each other. It's simply that the male is guarding the female when she's sexually re um, sex, um, receptive. And also the more male neighbors there are, the closer the male is to his partner, checking up on her. And, sorry, and he, during the period of mate guarding, he's also losing considerably um, body mass. So, um, and um, the higher his body mass is, that means the, the, the more reserves he has, the, the closer he is to his female, showing that he has enough energy to show this mate guarding behavior. This here is the graph of the body mass that before and after mate guarding, they, during this period of mate guarding, they significantly lose body mass, showing that there is a cost associated with it. But um, this is a paper we're actually at the moment working on. Um, on an overview article, um, we, we show that Many elephant shrews are pair living, but they can also show different forms of social organization. And in fact, there has been so far no published studies on paternity, but there's one unpublished study with data from uh, my field site that shows that extra pair paternity actually in these pair living elephant shrews is quite high. Um, with, with, from samples from 19 offspring, at least six were sired by another male. So that is, um, one, nearly one third of the offspring. So even though the males do show mate guarding, extra pair paternity can be quite high, also showing how important this um, strategy is for the males. Then we have obligate monogamy. That is the typical monogamous species we know, which in contrast to the other one, there is a pair bond. So the male and the female of a pair typically see each other to be close. They are nice to each other. They might groom each other or whatsoever. There's often paternal care. In all these species, you see here that the fathers also take care of the offspring. That's in these um, discus fish. For example, here you see some parental care. Though this is the female, this is the male. And here you see, if you see these little dots here are the offspring of this pair. And what they're actually doing, they're eating from the skin of the parent because during the period that they have um, young fish, they're producing a protein and um, sugar rich um, um, slime on, on their skin and, and the, the, the fry, the, the little fish are going and, and eating from the skin of the parents. And this is called a discus milk. Um, this occurs population density of, of these obligate monogamous species is typically higher than of the um, facultative monogamous species. 
partners have the same territory, uh, but also in these species, extra pair paternity can be quite common. And that's what we see here in, um, and I think before I, because I'm talking already for 50 minutes before I talk about um, these um, studies on extra pair paternity, which are quite important to understand, I'm going to make a 10 minutes break now from, from my, on my watch it's five to two, two, and then I will continue five after three. And if you have questions, you can, I'm going to, to fetch a coffee now. If you have questions, you can write it in the comments here. And what I would also like to know from you is whether you have time until four o'clock or whether because of other lectures, I have to finish quarter to four so that I, that I don't um, um, take too much time. And um, if somebody could um, drop some, some message here in the comments that, that, I, that, I, that I do it um, the appropriate way. So I'm going to fetch a coffee. In the meantime, if you have questions, please write it down here. I will also look on YouTube now and then I can, can address this.
So I see a nice cat. Does anybody have any questions? You should really feel um, um, free to ask questions. Interactions always um, help 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 everybody. So it's of course also lo nice looking at cats and snakes and. So and can somebody please indicate to me um, whether I can talk until four o'clock or have to finish quarter to four because I know normally normally I should finish quarter to four so that students can change their um, lecture halls. But maybe because it's remote, you even have more time constraints. If I don't hear anything, then I will just, um, yeah. Keep on talking. Okay, so the 10 minute break is over, then I will continue and um, we'll see how long I, I'm going to, I think I have anyway too many slides, but then I will also see when, what, when you guys are disappearing and, and go out of the meeting because you have to go somewhere else, might also be an indication. Now this paper here is quite important, it has been published more or less a, a year ago in, uh, in, in September last year, again showing that Living in pairs, like we see in most birds, doesn't mean that they are monogamous, but um, that um, extra pair copulations can be quite common. And this here shows the number of studies on extra pair copulations, which of course depended on the emergence of um, microsatellites in um, 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 genetics that people could really measure reproductive success. It also shows, you see that we increase of ability of this method, more and more studies have been done, but that even these days, um, there are still many studies um, on this topic. So we have quite some information and the number of publications you see here um, it's more in, in this review from last year is 500 studies on 300 pair living bird species. And asking how can one explain them this extra pair paternity. And here we see that it to a large extent, it depends on, on the family. Here we have different um, um, families of birds. Here are the Passeride, so these are most of the songbirds. I'm not so good, uh, COVID, COVID, uh, you know, the Covids. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not really an ornithologist, so I, I told you there, I think these are the uh, pigeons, but I'm not sure if that is correct. Maybe there's a good um, ornithologist in the audience who know it better. But the important thing is that to be really genetically monogamous, it should be 0%. It's nowhere the case. But here there are some families with quite low um, degrees of extra per paternity. But here 20%, I think, is already quite a lot. Imagine it would be 20% in humans. If we are here, um, when you take the people on... Um, on YouTube, we are 30 people, 20%. That would mean that six of us have a different father than he or she believes. So even though these species are living in pairs, it doesn't mean that they're socially monogamous. And one thing that this refuge found is that there's actually a strong phylogenetic signal that a lot of this variation is um, more dependent rather on the family to which the species belongs than on any of the um, environmental factors they were looking at. Um, 
What they also found is that it's relatively species specific that when they had um, and some species that are quite common like great tits, blue tits, um, and, and some, some uh, starlings um, that have been studied in more than one population that there's a strong correlation between the degree of extra pair paternity if one species, if the population of one species shows um, high degrees of extra pair paternity and then the other population also showed it. So it seems to be a species specific and um, family specific um, pattern. And um, when on the other hand, they look on the um, geographical distribution of species with um, around, or these are populations now, not species, um, populations with between 0% of extra per paternity to a high degree of more than 50%. Then it's also distributed all over the world. And it's not like one can say, okay, in the tropics, they all have, oh, no, these are not really tropics, these are subtropics. So here uh, in the tropics, actually, a few studies, the tropics or the subtropics, they do not show a different pattern than from the temperate climates, like here in Middle Europe or, or North America. There doesn't seem to be a in direct influence on this. No, I have to go the other way. And um, there was also no um, big difference between socially monogamous species and cooperative breeders. The difference is in socially monogamous species, the offspring um, after hatching, they're still fed. And then when they become adult, they leave, leave the pair. In cooperative breeders, um, the offspring stays with the parents and helps with um, taking care of the younger siblings of the next brood. And this kind of um, care system also had no influence. Um, again, showing how widespread this pattern is, and it doesn't seem to be easily explained by environmental factors. And that's what I say here, no clear ecological or life history variable explains extra per paternity, but phylogeny is important. So it seems to be um, something that um, occurred during evolutionary history and then was um, maintained between specific families. Something similar, a uh, similar study on, on mammals. And here, this is um, from Aurélie Koha and Dominique Alain in, in some nice colleagues of mine in, in Lyon. And here it's just from the title of the paper, they talk about social structure, but when they talk about social structure, it's what Kaplan, Van Schaik, and as such myself call social organization. It's a composition of groups. And they found that um, the, Social structure influence, it's a social influence expert pattern in socially monogamous mammals. That means that in family living, here again, we have the proportion of extra per paternity for comparison solitary species, pair living ones, and living ones in families. Families is again something like um, cooperative breeding. The adult or offspring can remain within their parents and take care of younger offspring. For example, um, under some ecological conditions, we find this in. Um, in, in shackles in some areas, or we find this in, in um, African wild dogs that live in families while pair living species are more like, um, not always, but too often the red fox in, 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 in Middle Europe. And this seems to have, have an influence here in contrast to what was found in the birds. And you might also see this paper was published 10 years earlier than, than the bird paper, which is why the bird paper was testing this hypothesis for, for the birds as well. So comparing the so-called obligate and facultative monogamy, the pair bond is only present in the obligate, but not the facultative one. Paternal care in the, in the obligate, but not the facultative one. Relationships here are missable. Here they're not admissible. They rather ignore each other. They just look after uh, at each other, but they don't um, seek each other's um, closeness. Mate guarding is present in the obligate monogamy also. I mean, they're always together, but it's especially important in facultative monogamy. Population density here is high, here it's low. An extra per paternity can be quite high. And in um, the facultative one, it can be very low, like in the dictic, but also the little data we have from elephant shrews shows that it might be quite, can also be quite high here. So the mate guarding is not always working 100%. So monogamy, I also emphasize this as it's an important um, term for many people. And there was a new um, refi article coming out two years ago by Kvarnemo in um, Biological Refuse. 
And here monogamy is defined as males and females typically mate and reproduce with only one partner. So like in Kaplan and Van Schaik, it's really the mating system here, not the social organization. Monantry is when each female mates and reproduces with only one male. And so this can also be in otherwise um, polyandrous species where one male has access to several females. Monogyny is each male mates and reproduces with only one female. And mutual monogamy, monotrinantry is then what two people typically understand as monogamy is um, one male and one female mate and reproduce only with each other. But as here the focus is on the mating system, they differentiate between these um, three um, subtypes. For them, in contrast to climate, facultative monogamy is, means that monogamy that varies between species or even within individuals, for example, relation density of mates or some other resources, meaning um, some individuals might mate monogamously, but in the same population or same species, other individuals might have a different mating system. Contrast to obligate, Okay, I see somebody said there's no lecture right after 4 p.m. So I'm not so time constrained unless somebody else writes something else because I don't know if everyone has the same lectures. But thanks for this information. Now come back to Farnermo, obligate monogamy means that monogamy does not vary in race to density of mates or other resources. They are always monogamous. And this is also again, because I said at the beginning, it's always difficult to define and not only to define, but also to say which definition one is using. So there are differences in how obligate and facultative monogamy are used by these two different studies. Now I'm coming to promiscuity, random mating. Why do I come to this? Um, this um, just gives an overview again about um, the different kinds of um, mating system. I had discussed now from promiscuity to, to monogamy. Um, and why do we have this variation in mating systems? Why do not just all species um, do the same? And one um, of the basic principles to understand here, to understand all social systems is um, that um, as males and females differ in the gametes they produce, they also differ in what inc increases their um, reproductive success. Males go around and copulate with many females and stay home and take care of the offspring. That would be the best thing for males to do, to have a lot of, of offspring, a high reproductive success. Uh, while females mate and then for them in the idle world, they would mate and then leave the eggs or the offspring with the male. The male takes care of the, of the offspring and the female goes and eats and gets resources to produce more eggs to have the highest reproductive success for her from an evolutionary point of view. And this obviously leads to conflict between the sexes because what males want from females is not the same than what females want from males. And this is all and from an evolutionary point of view, depending on the difference in um, gamut size. And this, the outcome of this conflict and determines the mating system, social organization and care system. And what the outcome is, of course, depends on the environment. So what we talk about here is the economics of female monopolization. So can males defend one female, several females or not? And this depends on female group size, female home range size and seasonality of breeding. So it's a difference whether there's only one single female every two kilometers or whether every few hundred meters there's a group of, of 10 females um, has an influence on what tactics will pay out for males to increase their reproductive success. So what is possible is one uh, possibility is that females are solitary and the range is defensible by males. So in many mammalian species, females are solitary and males defend territories overlapping the territories of females. And when the female home ranges are small, then a male can defend areas containing several females. He can have a large home range overlapping with several females and have a polygynous mating system. But if the female home ranges are also very large because there's little food, for example, in the elephant shrews I talked about, they eat on insects and in the dry habitats they live in, there are not that many insects. So they need a large home range to find enough food. 
then these how many might be so large that one male can only defend the how much of one female and not of several females, um, causing a monogamous mating system. Um, the other possibility when the female home ranges are large is that males don't defend any female home range, but they roam of a large area. So the males don't have one specific area, but they go over the entire habitat. And today they're here, tomorrow they are somewhere else. And then they might need several females. So they um, can mate with more than one female, but the females are also visited by different males of a different time, which would then lead to a polygyn undress um, mating system. And this is especially if it occurs then mainly in large mammals, while for small mammals to range over a large area might be because of predation pressure and the need to have um, hiding places um, more costly. So female range, uh, females are solitary range defensible by male. One example I have here is um, the Grassland striped mouse, Troptomys dialectus, which I myself studied uh, many years ago here in these in Kamberg, uh, grasslands in South Africa, close to the borders of, of Lesotho. And here we find that um, the male home range is shown in, in black and, and, and solid lines, and the female home range is shown in dotted lines. The males have much larger home ranges than the females. And they do overlap typically um, with, with, with several females and every female also like this female overlaps with two males and, and this female also with two males. So that both um, sex have the opportunity to mate with more than one individual of the opposite sex. Another example are orang utans where females have very large home ranges because tropical rainforest might look um, nice and green to you. But if you like to eat fruit, there's actually not a lot of fruit in such a, a rainforest. And um, the most important fruiting trees might be dispersed far away. And as such, um, orang utans need very large home ranges to find um, there are enough fruiting trees and food and males can also move over wide ranges. They associate temporarily with a female. If a female comes in estrus and then try to mate with the female and if she's out of estrus, the, the male might wander away in the forest and to very far away and try to find another female while the female itself might only wander for a few kilometers until she finds the next um, fruiting tree. Then um, in many species, especially primates, females are social. The reason why they're social is typically because it gives them protection against predation and they live in habitat where there's enough food that a group of females can share the same territory. And then when females form a group, males can take over the territory of these females and defend the female group against other males. This is then called female defense and um, polygyny. Like I'm here see in these um, white colobus monkeys um, of East Africa. When the female groups are very large and the home range is two, then one male might not be able to defend the group by himself alone. But then a group of males might cooperate together with um, defense of this territory with the group of females like we see in chimpanzees and lions. And then typically um, these males are closely related to each other because of kin selection. Um, this then can have inclusive fitness benefits of uh, that um, closely related males, like in uh, two, or, two or three male lines together um, cooperating. Sometimes female are social, but the range is not defensible. So um, then we have the possibility that female movements might be predictable. So you can, the males can predict where the females will be. And then males might defend territories that are much smaller than female home ranges, but the females have to go through. We see this, for example, in the Gravis zebra or in the springbok, where large herds of females with the offspring range over a big area. And the males have small home ranges. And at some stage, the females come through. And then the male springbok, within one, two days, he tries to mate with as many females as possible. And then the females are gone um, after two days and, and in, in other area or they might have to come to land, like um, of elephant seal females, you cannot really predict. Uh, they are not foraging in as a group in the ocean trying to find fish, but the males can predict they will have to come on shore for giving birth and also to change their food. Also when they change their food, they have to come to land 
and then the area where they have to come to um, can be um, defended by these males and then gives them access to a larger number of, of females. And the lacking species like here, the topi in um, East Africa, I discussed before, they just are building these legs where several females, males display and the females are attracted by this and they then come and choose the most interesting male for them. So sometimes females are sociable. The range is not defensible by, by a male because um, they range over a large area and it's not predicted where they really go. But in this case, uh, males might still be able to defend them by just being with the females all the time, like we see here in this um, Hamadrias baboon, also in, in herds of, um, of um, plains. Uh, and, but also a uh, mountain zebras where one male is together with a small group of females and they are um, just always together and range over a la large, large area. Then when females are doing behaving like this, but they're in very large groups like we find in the African buffalo, then um, one single male, he cannot defend a group of 20, 40, 50, a few hundred females. Then these groups, um, might have a large number of males and wandering together um, around with them. So what you've already seen in these examples, it was all mammals. Um, in mammals, it seems to be quite common that um, one male mates with several females and sometimes that one female mates with several males at the same time in these polygenantrous groups. But birds, especially songbirds, but also most other species of birds are known to be pair living and why do we find this difference between birds and mammals so this has something to do with female distribution in birds female interests <coughs> and um, that females are highly aggressive against other females female birds they need a territory with enough food which often includes insects if not for themselves but then for their offspring and that's a scarce resource to be defended against other females. So they keep females out of, of their territory. And there's only one female. And then the male um, is kind of um, forced to occupy the same territory and stay together with, with, the, with the female. So then what are the male's interests? Also males, of course, they don't like to um, share paternity with other males. So they're highly aggressive. And one of the main reasons why female live in, but why, birds live in pairs is that a male and a female share a territory and the male keeps out all other males and the female keeps out all, all other females and that's what remains is a pair even though the male itself if he would have the chance would mate with several females but his females um, makes this impossible the female would also mate with several males but um, her male and um, keeps all the other males away But sometimes in some species, what is observed is poly territoriality. And in that case, what, what, what you will find is that a male defends a territory with one female and mates with her, but then he flies away and he builds up a second territory, maybe half a kilometer away. And then he attracts a second female. And so he is forming a pair with, with two females at two different places. And like this, um, he has then still a poly, um, polychinous um, mating system. And this occurs, for example, in 12% of um, pied flycatchers here in Europe. It's a European species, also in the European nightjar. Here you see pictures of these two interesting species, the nightjar. Very rare. Actually, I've never seen one in Europe, only in Africa, while the pied flycatcher is um, in our, um, I'm not sure if it's forest or at the edge of forest, I'm quite a common species you might, might have seen um, also here in the Alsace. But females are they're typically aware of the polytrial status of the males. It's not like they don't know that he already has a territory when they settle in his second territory. And then the question is, why do they still become um, polychinous? And this here is the famous polygyny threshold model. And um, here, um, male birds, bird males, Male birds would always benefit from living in a polytrinous situation when they can um, have offspring with several females, they have higher reproductive success. But this imposes costs on the female bird, the first uh, shared pa paternal care. 
because in all these species, um, the males um, provision the offspring with food. So they show paternal care, which is Not that I'm okay, uh, you guys were just freezing here. I didn't want to talk just to a frozen screen. And then uh, next week, somebody tells me you, you didn't hear half of, of my presentation. But now you're moving again. So shared paternal care, the male um, provides food for the offspring. And if there are stop less many offspring, there's only half as much for each chick. Then shared resources of the territory. And therefore, the female birds normally do prefer the monogamous situation, which means repel other females and do not mate with a male that already has a mate. And here we talk about the situation of the polyterritoriality, but that within a territory, a second female um, would settle down. However, um, the environment is variable in space, and it can be that the quality of the second of a, of a breeding territory of a paired male might be better than of a bachelor male. And then it, for the female that comes in, it might be better to mate with this already mated male than to with a, pair with a male who has no female yet. And this is <coughs> um, what we see here. We have here the quality of the breeding situation. That means the quality um, of the territory. Here we have female reproductive success. So the higher it goes here, the better for the female. And um, so here is the, are the good territories, here are the not so good territories. And now we have um, two males, male A and B. And um, Wait a moment. I have to, so the highest, so the fee, the first females should settle with male B because it's the highest reproductive success, and the second female um, should um, settle with um, male A. And here we see what would be the reproductive success of the of the female, the second female coming in. She has the choice if this male already has a female to settle with male A or become the second. Um, female of male B, and there's obviously a um, difference in the um, in the in the fitness, and that's why, that's why she should um, choose um, male um, A. And then we have here um, male C, which has a very good um, home range. Home range, and we see here the second female that settles with male C has a higher reproductive success than any female that would settle with male A and B and thus the second female coming in should rather prefer to become the second female of male C than the first female of male A and B. So female one would definitely go to male C, he has the best territory. And female two would also go to male C because she's doing better becoming the second female here than becoming the female of one of the two other males. And then the third female should go to male B. And if there would be a fourth female um, should go to male A. And if there are three males and three females in this theoretical population, it shows you that one male will not be able to attract the female at all, while the, the, the other male um, will benefit from, because of his um, good territory, that he will be able to attract two females into his territory. Now, if there are four females, um, and, and four males, males A, B, C, and D, female one, two, three, and four. So the first female, there we have again the poly, polygeny threshold between male D and male, male C. The first female obviously will go to um, male D, who has the best territory. The second female will go to male C because here we have the threshold of the, um, the polygeny threshold. And um, he, his territory is not so much better than of this male that he would attract the second female. But then the third female, because here the threshold is, is much lower, would go to, to male D and form a polygynous group, while the fourth female would go to male B. 
and then if there would be a fifth female, I would get, go to two male A here. So and this here is the poetry threshold that I'm depending on the fitness differences between um, these territories and the females then choose one or the other male. And this has also been um, not only theoretically developed, but also studied in um, case studies here in this um, lark bunting, Calnospitza melano chorus. Um, it's, um, I think it's a species from, from um, North America and where <coughs> the, um, they live in open plains. There are no trees and it can get um, there are very few trees, a few trees and few shrubs, and it can get when the sun shines in summer, in the breeding season directly on the breeding territories can get very hot. And when there's a lot of shade, it's good because um, the eggs and the chicks are protected from overheating. And if there is um, very little shade, then um, the territory is of bad quality because um, it's not so good for the chicken egg development. And so they had here um, different um, 19 different territories or different 19 different males and then relative dates. It's the first day of the study and the ninth day of the study and then the females coming in. You see the first females were all going to the best um, territories on the first day, the second day again, and then at some stage, um, the, sec the next females coming in were choosing to become the second female of the males with the best territories. In, and um, this depended on the quality of the territory. And then some males with the best territories ended up having three females in the territory, while other males, the ones um, here, they, with the low quality territories only had um, one female and the, especially the ones with the worst territories, they got the first female and other males already had a second female attracted to the high quality um, territory. So we talked about uh, mating systems today and um, there we have two different aspects. We first see who is mating with whom, and then we can easily talk about um, monogamy, polygyny, polygynandry. But when we look at the genetics, and I've showed you this already in the pair living sp um, species of both mammals and birds. Then we see that the genetics tell us that it's often um, not so clear. And even in pair living species, multiple paternities are quite common. And so we have intraspecific variation in mating systems. This is a study by um, Steve Dobson and co-workers. Steve Dobson, he is actually at um, Austin, Texas in the United States, but, but he also is um, a visiting researcher here in Strasbourg. So he spent quite some time here and he is hopefully coming back to spend significant time at our lab um, next year. And, what, and this graph is just our all different uh, mammal species, not only pair living ones. It's just to show you that um, the probability of multiple paternities between here 0% and 100% is very high within these, I don't know how many, uh, more than 100 species of mammals with data available. And this means that maybe instead of categorizing species into um, polyandrous, polychinous, polychinandrous, monogamous, putting them into these different categories. It might be more interesting in the future to show on the degree of multiple paternities and extra group and extra pair paternities to describe mating systems than um, just using these um, simple um, categories. So extra pair and extra group, group copulations and paternities are common. Extra group means, for example, there's one male with three females, but these three females still might have um, paternities with other males than the male of, of the group. So mating systems are rather continuous, like shown here, where we have this continuous variation of, um, extra, of multiple paternities within a litter. Then um, categorical, even though for us humans, it's always much easier to think in categories than in um, Continu continuous, continuous lines. And um, how this variation of uh, mating systems can be in mammals, I show you here a, a, an example of my own 
um, study species, the African striped mouse in South Africa that lives in this um, study often in groups. Like we have, we have one group with one breeding male and four breeding females. This red um, back here is, um, this is hair dye because we've been painting the mice so we can identify them individually in the field. And um, the red in these um, pie diagrams, the red part is the amount of paternity by the male from the group. And we see that overall, the male um, sires only 64% of the offspring of his group. And interestingly, this is this pink, and the highest percentage of the remaining offspring are sired by males from neighboring groups. But then we also have um, roaming males. These are males that are solitary. They don't have a group. They range over a large um, area. They also have a little bit of paternity. And um, these are young males from neighboring groups. In some cases, we don't know who was the offspring. And very important here is um, female mate choice because we then um, compared also between old females and young females in the groups. And what we found is um, when we look at old females, this would these here are for old, old females, then um, the percentage of paternity by the male of the group is much higher and there's very few unresolved paternity. But when we look at young females, we see that the male of the group has a very low paternity. The one of the neighboring males is much higher and actually unknown males and have a very high um, success. Now, what are young females? They have a breeding season of about four months, three to four months, depends on the year. And in this year, it was a relatively long breeding season. Breeding depends on how much rain falls in the habitat and how, how long there's food available. And sometimes um, females born in a breeding season, they can breed the same year. When the breeding season is long enough, they can reach sexual maturity at about six to eight weeks of age. And when the breeding season is uh, three, four months, then they might be able to reproduce again. Now, the problem is because of inbreeding avoidance, they um, normally do not want to mate with, with their potential father. So that's a breeding male of the group. And that is why these young females here that live in the same groups like they, they are it seems that they avoid the breeding male of their group and instead mate with other males, neighboring males, but also to a large extent with, with unknown males, males we could not even identify. We think the reason why they actually, if they can, and obviously they can find some other males, why they prefer them, while here these females, they have only 1%, is the overall extra group paternity. Because there's not only a the risk that the male of their group is the father, but also here in pink, that the male of a neighboring group might be their father. And thus the best tactic for them would actually be to mate with a male that has nothing to do with um, the social situation, but that is rather from far away. And this shows you that with hen species, we can have quite some variation in mating tactics who the females choose um, to mate with depending on their social situation. And also the degree of extra group paternity um, can vary considerably here. The degree of extra group paternity for all females is 23%, while for young females, it is um, 82%, um, um, much, much higher. And we did a literature research on this intraspecific variation in mating systems in um, Artiodactyla. So Artiodactyla are part of the ungulates. You see here like the, the pigs, the camels, the antelopes um, um, belong to this. And um, interestingly of the 193 species, um, for most of the species, we do not have any information. So it's only um, a few species and polygyny occurs in 24 of the species, polyandry, in none of the Artiodactyla at all, polytrinandry in five species, and monogamy in only one. But variation is quite common. Seven species show the variation, all having the option of um, polygyny, that um, is the most common form within the Artiodactyla, but also polytrinandry and uh, monogamy, showing that, again, when we talk about um, mating system in these categories, it might be much more variable um, than this and what has been appreciated. And we might have to take this variation into account in the future to come to a better understanding. And this is uh, how, when we then look at um, 
ancestral state estimations. These are statistical tools to try to predict what was the ancestral state. So the ancestor of all the Artiodactyla that are shown here, all the species with data available. And then we see that poly, uh, polygyny um, was the most likely state. And um, this can help us to understand um, the evolutionary um, history of mating systems here and can explain why um, this is the most common observed mating system within um, Artiodactyla. So with this, I'm Coming now to the alternative um, reproductive tactics, it's also explained some variation in mating systems. And I, I will now, as we have now um, 17 minutes left, I will only give a short introduction on what, what it is and then finish the lecture for today. Also, that you still have time to ask questions if there would be still any questions coming up. Um, we might. Um, find variation in tactics animals choose to reach reproductive success. And these are so-called alternative reproductive tactics. Here individuals follow different discrete tactics to reach reproductive success. And discrete means individuals of two different tactics differ consistently in the way they reach reproductive success. So it's not only that um, they uh, pair living male and um, also is gaining extra um, pair paternity with neighboring females, but that um, there are two different types of males. There are the males maybe that have a territory and defend it, and there may be males that are, have a sneaking tactic and do not defend the territory. And in some species, like for example, here in this um, 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 Anolis lizard from, um, and from North America, they might even differ morphologically. Like we have here some males with a yellow throat, some with a blue throat and some with a very light throat. And they differ from the way they look like, but they also differ in their behavior. Like in other species here in these tree frogs, you might have calling males that attract females and satellite males that sit next to the calling males, waiting if some males come. They don't differ morphologically apart from the fact that the calling males typically are much larger and more competitive then the smaller males and the smaller males are normally also younger and when they grow bigger, they might change their tactic. So like I said before, um, males um, reach reproductive success by trying to find and getting access to as many females as possible, while for females, it's more by recruiting resources and that they can do when the male takes care of the offspring and not the female. And because of this, alternative reproductive tactics are more common in males because males can increase fitness by monopolizing several females. But for females to monopolize several males can be of advantage if there is um, paternal care, which is not the case in many species, but the advantage is not as big. And this is why the variation in how successful males can be, uh, how successful they can be is much higher in males than females, explaining why there is more, um, um, well, it's more likely to find alternative reproductive tactics in the male than the female sex. But in polyandrous species where males monopolize paternal care, female arts can also evolve. And I, before I, fi I finish, um, I will just um, show here um, the example of alternative female reproductive tactics in the African striped mice, just to make clear that it's not something that only occurs in males. It can also be important in females. It's again, my study species from South Africa. Here females can have um, three tactics when they are juveniles and non-breeding. And when they reach a um, breeding age, and it's also the breeding season, they can either, and that's what most females do, form communal groups. It means there might be two, three, four females breeding together in a group. And they also show alloparental care, taking care of each other offspring, or they can leave the group and breed um, solitarily, or they can show the returner tactic. That means they might be in a group before they give birth, they leave the group and have the litter somewhere else and stay with their offspring for something like 10 days to two weeks. And then they bring the offspring back to the nest and form communal groups again. And now I have to, so um, the females can stay there or they can leave. And, but um, solitary females can also come into existence by in these small mammals, simply the fact that all the other females in the groups 
are dying, for example, are eaten by a predator like, like a snake or a bird of prey. And whether or not a solitary breeding female comes into existence because it chose to leave the group or because it was forced, because all female relatives are dead, um, has um, then different consequences because the um, solitary living females that have relatives in the population, which means they choose to be solitary, they are much heavier than all the other females that once that live in groups, while solitary females that were forced to become solitary as the other females disappeared, they have a similar body mass to the group living ones. And this already indicates that it's the most competitive females that follow the solitary tactic. And we also see this in um, a physiological marker, um, stress hormone levels, um, corticosterone. The solitary females that chose to become solitary living have low levels of the stress hormone, where females that remain in groups have much higher levels. And the females that were forced to be solitary they have corticosterone levels similar to the ones that remain group living where their relatives um, survived. So with this before, because otherwise uh, maybe just to, to say this, um, to stay more at home, female alternative reproductive tactics have also been observed in some bird species like the common moorhen, which also occurs here in, in Central Europe in, in parks and, and waters, which um, can have subordinate non-breeding helpers, other females that stay with their mothers and help her rearing the chicks. It can be incestuous females that stay in the family and mate with their, their father, but also help the mother. It can be floaters that are females that live alone. They mate with a male and when they have to lay eggs, they search the nest of a group living or pair living female and, and dump the eggs in there and leave it for the other females to, to, to take care of, of the eggs and the offspring. Or it can be dominant breeding females, which also cook whole nests of other females if they have the opportunity. So it can also be quite variable. I mean, females, how they reach reproductive success, and this not only in Africa, but also here in Central Europe. And with this, I will finish for today, but I'm still available um, for, for questions. And then I will talk a little bit more about alternative reproductive tactics, I expect next week. Okay, thank you very much for um, your attention and I'm still here now and please let me know if you have any questions, if something was not clear. And then also via the doodle, let me know if you prefer it, um, to be in the lecture hall next week, like, like is normal or not. And, and um, you can also contact me um, via email if there's anything you want to, to communicate to me. Good, thank you. And I will also look on YouTube. There's uh, no questions here, but I have to wait a bit because they have a delay. So if you have questions, you can also just raise your hand or, or switch on your microphone and talk. Okay, any questions? I see some people talking, but I don't know to whom.
so there's also no there are also no questions on um 